welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Dickens. I am the curator of the new gallery and the chair of the Visiting Artist Speaker Series here at Austin P. And tonight's event is brought to you by Austin P. State University's Department of Art and Design and SICA, the Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Yuchi, Shawnee, and Cherokee First Nations on which we are organizing, learning, and broadcasting today. I know we have many visitors tonight that are joining us from outside of Austin P. so thank you all for joining us. It's an honor to be able to share our renowned programming with the rest of the world. Um, you please follow the New Gallery, SICA, and the Department of Art and Design on social media outlets and stay informed about our upcoming visiting speakers and events. So tonight's format will be a little bit more conversational than, than normal. So feel free to ask questions throughout and we'll see where this conversation leads us. Uh, you can do this by utilizing the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. The chat will be turned off and I'll do my best to moderate the conversation. Um, I, I do have a feeling we will not be able to get to all the questions this evening, but I'll go ahead and apologize in advance if that happens. Um, so with all, all that out of the way, it's my honor to introduce our guest this evening, Eliza Evans. So Eliza Evans experiments with sculpture, print, video, and textiles to identify disconnections and absurdities in social, economic, and ecological systems. The initial parameters of each work are carefully researched and then evolve as a result of interaction with people, time, and weather. Evans was born in the Rust Belt, uh, steel in, in a Rust Belt steel town and raised in rural Appalachia. She currently splits her time between New York City, Hudson Valley, and now uh, McMinnville, Tennessee. Her work was exhibited at Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, New York, at the Edward Hopper House Museum in Nyack, New York, uh, Chashama Sculpture Field in Pine Plains, New York, Brick in Brooklyn, Purchase College in Purchase, New York, and uh, residencies include the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at UC Santa Barbara, the Bronx Museum, and Franconia Sculpture Park in Schaefer, Minnesota. Evans hold, holds an MFA from SUNY Purchase College in Visual Art and a PhD in Economic Sociology from the University of Texas at Austin. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Eliza Evans. Yeah. So I know this could be conversation, but I want to hit on this Dr. Eliza Evans, this PhD in economic sociology. I don't know a lot of artists that have a PhD in economic sociology. So I'm going to start off there because I know it's going to lead somewhere. So mm -hmm. tell me about how, like, yeah, let's start from there. What is an economic sociologist? Uh, well, very simply, uh, we like to distinguish ourselves from ec economists uh, in the way that economists deal with models and uh, economic sociologists actually deal with real data uh, and, and, real, and therefore the lives of real people. Um, but it, it's really about the, the, the interaction in, you know, in social life of uh, economic and political systems and and so my career got started, you know, I did my PhD work on uh, micro lending in rural India, and this was, would have been in the mid nineties. And you know, so it entailed, um, you know, some language ac acquisition and since then forgetting, uh, and you know, lots of field work and getting grants and going talk talking with lots of folks and then uh, producing my dissertation and after that, I ended up working in India and a number of other countries around the world, working with tech entrepreneurs. And it, what, not so much hands-on, you know, how do you fund and create a business, but how can the local community cr create a support system for, for entrepreneurs of, of every stripe? And uh, because life as an artist is hard, uh, I still do that. <laughs> and I really enjoy it now. Um, that it's not the real, the sole focus of my life. Um, you know, but I, you know, I had an academic job. I worked for a research center at the University of Texas uh, for a number of years. It, it was a phenomenal experience. I met incredible people, but eventually along the way, I 
decided to deploy my my research, not only my background, but it's just what I do anyway. Yeah, you, know, um, you know, I would have been a researcher with or without the PhD. I, you know, I like exploring things, and now I just use art to explore different uh, topics and issues that that matter to me, and and hopefully others as well. All right. So, what what was it that made you kind of leave that and mm-hmm. then pursue a career in art? Pursue your your an MFA. You know, I would like to say it was this really, you know, uh, sensible stepwise progression, and that isn't at all the case. Uh, it was an accident. Um, I, I was doing, uh, you know, at some time in, you know, about eight or 10 years ago, I went through a very analytical pro, uh, project. It was very number crunchy and I can, I can fake numbers, but it's not really, you know, I, my burning desire. Uh, and so it took a lot out of me and I thought, you know, I have a right side to my brain. I better go find it and exercise it before it liquefies. Um, and so I just took a, drawing 101 class at the local community college. It was actually a horrible class with a dreadful teacher. I mean, the, my fellow students were pretty amazing. Uh, but even at the end of that not very good class, uh, it, it, I don't know, it, 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 something was motivating me to, to keep showing up. And so I joined, you know, life drawing meetup groups and it became a hobby and then it became an obsession and then it took over my life. So I really say, you know, I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't asking for it. It felt like a mugging, you know, that, you know, I, I was not expecting or wanting to make this big turn um, because I was getting some satisfaction out of, out of my academic life, but uh, this was, it became something I just had to pursue and uh, to see, to take it at the beginning of taking it really seriously, I, I was in Austin at the time and I re- removed myself for over a year and I went to Santa Fe, just kind of get away from, you know, my, my networks and uh, expectations and went to a place where no one knew me. And I just did art 40 hours a week. I was in a, uh, you know, a classical realist atelier. So drawing from live models um, all day, every day, which was great training. It's not what I do now, but it was really foundational. And after that, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Time to go back to school. All right. So, so you didn't have a BFA at all. No, no, that, oh. that, that community college class was my very first art credit. Oh, wow. wow. So when you, uh, and I know we have a lot of undergrads here. So when you applied to grad school was mm-hmm. pretty much the, all the work from Santa Faye then, right? Yeah, it was, um, while I was there, uh, you know, it's painting and drawing, as I mentioned, but I also, by accident, uh, I took a, a little workshop on how to make better iPhone photographs so I could document my own artwork. But the workshop took place within a printmaking studio. And I'm looking around at all the equipment. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, print ma- the master printmaker was there because it was his buddy who was giving me the workshop. And I just talked to him and I ended up taking a workshop from him. And, and printmaking is, is really that, that, it was that experience where I said, okay, there's no turning back. You know, this, this makes sense to me. Um, you know, the, I was still doing observational figurative work, but mediated by technology. And, and um, that's, and so on the basis of that work, I applied to graduate school. Gotcha. It's funny how like uh, printmaking is often the, the, the gateway drug to <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> others. Because, uh, yeah, because, because it, there's, it's seen as two dimensional. It is two dimensional, but there's, there's so much, if you're, if you are carving reliefs, you're a sculptor. Uh, and there's a lot of technical know-how. Uh, so yeah. if you, you have to be attracted to that, and I, I think that is certainly a gateway into sculpture, which you know for me just opened up so much. 
So is that in it, your MFA? Was it printmaking or was it sculpture? Well, I, I came, no, I came in a printmaker. And again, I saw the, you know, uh, SUNY uh, Purchase College, which is part of the SUNY system is really unique. It's, t it's pretty small for a state school. It's 2000 students and it's where all the freaks go. Um, you know, is the, the theater students, the, mu the musicians, the dancers, the, the artists of every stripe. And, you know, there'll be, you know, a small minority of just liberal arts grad, uh, you know, majors, but it's, it's a, it's a creative campus. And uh, because of that, the facilities were phenomenal. So again, I've like, I looked at the wood shop and the metal shop and thought, oh, I, I've got to go figure, I don't know when I'll have access to this again. So I'll, uh, I'll go use it, figure it out. Which is key. And that's like, when you're in school and have access to all those facilities, use them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I've seen the Austin P facilities and I have drooled over them and it's amazing. So I'm so jealous of, of all, all you folks who are able to, to use them or at least perhaps, you know, soon. Right. So, um, and I know you have some images. Mm -hmm. So do you have any images of your, your older work, some of the beginning work and, and. Oh, no, no, no. I'm far too smart to <laughs> offer that up. <laughs> what about like postgraduate work? Like, like. Well, I, I, can show, I, I can show you the, fir my first slide here is a transition piece. So why don't we just. Uh, yeah. Why don't we just do that? All right. Um. And if anyone has any questions during this, please feel free. Um, the Q&A function is at the bottom. And if it's a relevant question of what we're talking about, we'll, we'll ask away. All right, go ahead. OK, so, uh, so this piece is called Transpiration. And this was the big, uh, well, for me, uh, a big transition from the studio to outdoor installation this fall. This is on the campus of SUNY Purchase College. Um, it's been up for, it's entering its fourth year now. These are live trees fully encased in heat shrink plastic. Uh, you have the same kind of plastic used to winterize boats or sometimes you'll see them to enclose construction site to protect them from weather. Uh, and, and, this what came from a commission I got right after I graduated and got my MFA. And so I, you know, again, I still had access to the purchase facilities, the grounds crew helped me out. So this was by far my largest project up to that point. And it was also the first time I, I moved outside. And so the idea of this piece is that, you know, the same population of co college campus would pass by this work every day, you know, the students for, you know, however long they're there, three, four, five years, and the faculty longer, and that the trees would slowly decay. Uh, and every now and again, uh, there'll, there'll be, a, you know, a, a feral bit of, uh, of tree growth that punches through the plastic. And when that happens, you know, a faculty member or a student will send me a picture of it. Uh, and then this, this one tree in the foreground actually collapsed last year. And, and so it's, uh, it's really a time-based piece, which I didn't fully appreciate at the time. And also because this is in the dead center of campus, uh, the students would use this as a platform for their own work, for performances, for their own installations in the middle of this, uh, this area that's, you know, it's in the center of campus near the library. And that I had not anticipated at all. And I absolutely loved it. And I'm like, oh, so it just, this was, you know, notionally interactive and that people would experience it over time, but they, that they themselves, you know, uh, periodically without plan, you know, they, they just, uh, you know, appropriate the site for their own purposes. And it's almost always on point. It has something to do with the interaction of humans and nature and, or, or technology. The, one student even installed a, um, like a surveillance camera on it, <laughs> which I thought was very odd and interesting. Um, so yeah, so this was kind of the, the gateway to my environmental work. Um, 
and I'll just go through a few pieces so you can see where, you know, how I think about materials and, 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 and working with people. This was uh, just something I threw up in my studio when I, uh, in, in Gowanus, which is a, a very arty part of Brooklyn. Uh, and we had an open studio. So I, I made this work uh, that took up the, my, the entirety of my tiny space. And the idea is you'll see two pulleys and there's a bucket of water underneath this bare root dogwood tree. And so, it, so at least two people would have to coordinate and lift the bucket to give the water a drink. And uh, I had a lot of fun with this project and I've come really close to making, you know, a, a, a much more formal version of this as a public installation or, or there's somebody who wanted to put it in their gallery and then uh, they freaked out about the water. So I haven't, haven't um, brought this to you know more f formal completion yet, but I really like to because it was it was a lot of fun. Um, this is uh, this was the inaugural piece in a sculpture field uh, that's part of a an art center and residency in upstate New York, and you know it's something you move your body through. You can barely see the clear acrylic tubes uh, off to the left there, but the 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 tubes fill with condensation in the morning and the evening so again it's a time-based piece and what this is uh it's the minimum systemization you need to protect chestnut trees which is a, a functionally extinct species uh, if, if you plant them they'll grow to live five or seven years and then they'll die before they can really propagate and so this is uh if you want to grow chestnut trees, you have to protect them. And, and this is the minimal way you can do it. So again, this, you know, bringing our, our system, systems of analysis and interventions to control and support nature, which is kind of the, the state we're in right now in terms of, you know, our impact on the climate. How do we um, bring back or prevent, bring back spe spe species of all kinds, or how do we preempt the, the di disappearance of, of species is only through you know, overwhelming human effort. And that, so there's a, a, a very early morning shot of the same installation. Yeah. So, so that's just a little bit of background. Um, so, so what got you working with nature to go from a printmaker to a sculptor to wrapping trees in plastic? <laughs> well, well, I think, well, one reason, well, I'm a, you know, I am a sociologist. I'm interested in systems. Printmaking you know, is a way, it is a systemization of creativity in a way. Uh, so I think, you know, you know, my, my way of thinking about the world and uh, not only with my brain, but my hands and my body, you know, and making a print is a really uh, physical process mm -hmm. as a sculpture. So this, I think what art did for me is kind of liberated the whole thinking body and, and got me out of just my head. Um, but if you look at each one of those, it's, there's a human element, you know, I, it might be mistaken for science, but this is really about how humans interact with the, with right. the world. And, and the, in those instances, instances, sorry, excuse me, instances, what, how do humans interact with the natural world? All right. So what are you kind of working on now? What's like some of your, do you have any recent projects that are uh, in the works, continuations, what, what, what you got? Yeah, well, I've, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about two projects, one at length and then the other we're gonna talk about uh, what uh, we're working on at Austin P. Um, so through my work, I just, I, I read a lot. I read a lot on climate change. I read about art. I read, I look at the science. I, I, I read a lot of business and technology news just to find, you know, what is going on. Uh, and of course I was aware that you know, our dependence on fossil fuels is a problem, but I really, I did a deep dive in it and, and, you know, in a few, few slides, you'll see why, but this is, um, 
first of all, I hope the design students who are logged on here are uh, re reacting complete horror at this graphic <laughs> because this is, I, I stole this from an oil company website. And this is how the oil industry describes, this is uh, a diagram of every single oil or gas well that has been drilled in the United States in the last 110 years. And you think they would have chosen a, a color other than black <laughs> uh, um, because it, this looks more like an infestation or a disease. Uh, and if you could see, like, I was really shocked to see the activity in Tennessee. Um, it's, you know, not near me in McMinnville or you over in Clarksville, but you know, there's a good bit of Tennessee that's had uh, activity historically and perhaps in the future with fracking. And if you'll excuse this really abbreviated oil and gas 101, what we have here are two scenarios of how you get oil and gas out of the ground. Uh, the one on the right is the one we think of in our imaginations. And if you've seen, you know, there will be blood or other movies, you know, you drill the well and you suck it out like it's a milkshake. Um, those days, at least in the US are mostly gone. That is not, there are very few new wells being drilled in this manner where it's very clear. What's happening is something called hydraulic fracturing, which we also call, you know, the vernacular is fracking. And that is on the left. And this is different in a number of ways. Now, if you see, it goes down a little bit deeper and then it turns and you'll see the little lines that indicate it is exploding rock to get at. It's, no, it's not liquid that they're extracting down there. They are exp they're, they're setting off explosions and breaking rock to get at, to free up the oil and gas that is in tiny little pockets. And I don't mean you know, pockets the size of you know, a marble, uh, these pockets are, are measured in microns, so tiny. Um, there's, the other big difference is they're drilling down two, three, four, five miles, and then they're turning and they're drilling these days probably up to two miles away from the well. So a lot, it's so much, um, it, so, so it takes up, so it's invisible. So, and that is what they're after. This is, this is an image of actual, an actual piece of shale extracted from one of these uh, fracking areas. So imagine getting oil and gas, squeezing it out of that in the, in the uh, expense and chemicals and uh, effort and, and all have to do that for 30, 40, $50 a barrel. But why do I care about it? Why is it, you know, personal, why, you know, it's, it's a huge issue worldwide. Why have I chosen this as, you know, the, the topic I care about right now. Um, this is a map of all the, the, the shale areas. So these are all the areas that are, are being fracked or could potentially be fracked in the US. And the black line is around Oklahoma where I had a great grandfather spend a little bit of time. I have never been to Oklahoma uh, and I know very little about it uh, except what I've read. However, I found out a few years ago that I own this. And it's a three acre piece of land in Creek County, Oklahoma. And the reason I know I own it is oil and gas companies started sending me letters and they want to lease the minerals underneath this land, uh, and they, which would be fracked. Um, and, and I'm like, oh, well, uh, no. <laughs> you know, it's, it would be inimical to you know, everything I believe in. You know, I, uh, and, you know, we're all implicated in the, in the fossil fuel economy, but this would directly implicate me in that for me to profit from this in any way is, uh, is, is just not an option for me. Uh, however, um, I, I have a few challenges. Uh, and, and one thing that, it, you know, I, I started researching how, how can I say no to these oil companies? And I, 
I was shocked to find that not only do I own the, these three acres, I own the minerals underneath, but in the US, it's a very special place in, in the sense that private citizens own the mineral wealth of the nation. So if you buy a house or you buy a farm, no matter how large or small, chances are you own the minerals underneath. And that ownership extends in theory to the center of the earth, which is 4,000 miles. So it's this vast 3D space that we're used to just seeing on maps. Maps like this. <laughs> So here, here's my problem. Um, so my three acres is represented by the green dot. And this green dot is a jointly owned, you know, roughly hundred acre unit, which is this, the, the red square thing. Um, and I don't know the other owners, um, they don't know me, but the, it's the yellow square that's the big deal because that is 640 acres, that is what an oil company needs to permit from the state to put in a well. And they only have to have permission from half of the owners. If, they, if half the owners say yes, they can force the other 50% to be a part of their, uh, their drilling operation, whether you want to or not. Um, and with just three acres out of the 640, and why 640? Because that's a square mile. Um, you know, so, so I, it's a very lonely place to be. And I've been told by, I don't know how many lawyers or people, and this is, I spent 20 years in Texas before going to New York. So I know a lot of people who know something about the oil and gas business and everybody was telling me you don't have options. So I'm alone in the universe with a problem that I just can't solve until I'm like, I'm an artist, that's my job. Isn't that, you know, I'm sure almost everybody on this call is an artist or a creative person of some kind. And, and that's our job is to figure things out. So I created this, this is my project all the way to hell. Uh, meaning, you know, that's where our, our, our ownership, ex the, our mineral ownership extends all the way to the center of the earth. And in the Latin, it's all the way to hell. Um, and as a project, I'm going to give away the mineral rights to a thousand people. And that fractures the party into a thousand different bits. And that means the oil company has to reach out to every single new owner, attempt to negotiate a lease. This is all very expensive. You know, tracking down the new owners, making offers, registering these offers with the state. Uh, and the new owners don't have to do anything. They can ignore it. They could sell it. They could. They can continue selling it or giving away. It doesn't matter because the getting their hands on these three acres is going to be a monstrous and very expensive pain. And and the and the and the the people who are responsible for negotiating with the landowners are called or they're called land agents. And they're, they're not direct employees of the oil companies. Often they don't even know who the oil company is. And, and so the way they're paid, they go into the, the county office where all these deeds are registered. They're going to see this big, fat, hairy mess. And they will walk away because it is not worth what they're being compensated to, to work this out. So there's, there is... Uh, there's me and the people joining me in this project in that, that yellow square that the oil company must lock up, just being annoying, which is the whole point. So what do the participants in this project own? They own a mineral right, they're not, they're not, not the surface, but the minerals underneath, roughly 12 by 12, you know, think of a, a room in a suburban house, I don't right. doubt dorm rooms are this big, but you know, I'm, we've all been in bedrooms about that size. Not too, it's not huge, but it's not tiny. And again, it goes all the way to the center of the earth. So, 4, 000, so 12 by 12 feet by 4,000 miles. And because I'm a big geek, I figured out, the sculptors among you, I hope you appreciate this, that it's almost a trillion cubic feet and very, very heavy. 
Uh, and and this is pos- this could I haven't looked it up. Doesn't really matter, but I'm just saying this is the largest land art project ever attempted. Uh, so because why not? So. <laughs> and there and there's us and there's the green the green stripe where the uh so however far down the drillers can drill you know because the right. technology is getting better and better and better as long as we hang on to our pieces of paper called a mineral deed we will be in the way of whatever they want to do you know in this area right so a question just popped up which is a great segue Sure. So when choosing the thousand people to give the land to, do you randomly choose those people or do they also have the same ideolo- I- ideologies as you have? And I am going to put this in the chat. This is the website and I'll let you take it from there. So these are these well, thousand yeah. people. What is, how that, is, how yeah, does this work? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's some selection effect. Um, but it's, it's random, and um, which is a great segue. Because, <laughs> so here is uh, how this work was exhibited at a gallery in Chelsea in New York City, a very good gallery, the Thomas Urban Gallery. Uh, I was part of a group show called Ecofeminisms. Um, there were giants in this show. I could not, I was just knocked out by um, the company I was keeping in this gallery space. And, but this, even though this show was up from, I believe, I think it opened in May and it was open through, through the end of September. You know, we all know what, what was going on with COVID and uh, the, enjoy in our ability our limited ability to enjoy art in person Mm -hmm. um you know the gallery did a great job i thought okay i am going to get next to no traction from from at least this physical manifestation of the work fortunately the curator and the gallery owner have a lot of hustle and this show ended up with a lot of publicity and I was lucky enough where one, mine was one of the works that was uh, at least described, often not in a lot of detail, in, in these periodicals. So that's great publicity uh, and some credibility as well, as well. But I still had a problem. How do, how do I get people to sign up? Because when I imagined this work, I thought of go, you know, uh, going to craft fairs and church bazaars and, you know, art happenings or, you know, any kind of uh, event where people would gather and I'd have my table and I could talk, you know, perform the work uh, and try and try and uh, get people to join me Uh, or at least have interesting conversations about it. And I knew that just was not going to happen for the foreseeable future. So I was really stuck. So I, scrubbed every email address I've ever had and I created a newsletter and and I just sent them out to uh, as many people as I can think of and I'm not exactly sure what how many that ended up being but it's a couple hundred at least and then I remembered I met a woman at a birthday party two or three years ago and she has this awesome weekly newsletter called SciFly fly if any of you are interested let me know and i'll hook you up uh it's a and it's about queer futurity so this is you know dealing with uh you know ai and uh blockchain and uh queer speculative futures a re- really fascinating event list so so she'll list courses and events and and shows and i said well this is you know mine is as low tech as you can get but it is about the future so I just sent her a description and some images. I said, would you just post this as one of your events? And what she did is she centered it, you know, in her, in her next newsletter, which was a huge, you know, lift for me. And that, so that was great. I, and so people signed up from that. Um, there's a project called the Listings Project, uh, which started uh, help, helping uh, New York creatives deal with their the challenge of finding studio and living space in New York City. And now it's, it's spread beyond that. So if any of you have 
you know, internships or, or job opportunities elsewhere, please, you know, check out this site. But it's about real estate. I thought, well, my project is about real estate. I'll just post this as an opportunity, uh, you know, because we're, all, you know, the participants in this project are basically squatting on these mineral rights. Uh, and th that, and again, they, they put, because it was hilarious, they, they posted this as like their, their featured listing for that week. Um, there's a really goofy lo-fi listing service for quirky opportunities in New York City, like the all-night drag show, um, or or uh, or mutual aid, like people, you know, knitting circles. It, it it could be anything. And so I again, I just wrote wrote the the person who puts this together, and uh, hey, can you help me out? And he created a new thing because it, it was usually like events or, uh, you know, it was more event driven. And so he just created this thing called Artie Stuff, which en he ended up sticking in his newsletter. So other creative projects and it got some exposure because of this, you know, my initial just reaching out and asking. Um, and again, I have no idea who the, who the person behind this is, but it was a huge lift. Oh, and also somebody who signed up for the minerals called me. He says, I'm an art writer. We talked for two hours, nothing happened of it, but literally like last week he came back to me. He's like, I'm working with an editor. I still don't know who the publication is. So you never know if you just send it, send it out to the universe in the ways that you can, uh, how it will come back to help. And so these are the random people. There are over 350 now. Um, and uh, you know, from you know, all over all over the country, some international. There's the limit by U.S. by federal law, only U.S. citizens or um, permanent residents can own mineral rights. So there is that limitation. There is no limitation on age. I believe the young, youngest participant is four. <laughs> um, and. Uh, so, so kids are signing up themselves, uh, you know, so people in the, the one thing that I want to work on for the future is find out why, you know, because I, 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 I know many of these people because they're friends of mine or we've crossed paths, right. uh, but some of them, I have no idea how they learned mm -hmm. about this project. And that's like kind of the delights of it too. Um, you know, that this can happen without our even knowing each other. Um, right, right. I'm, I'm going to put like that, what you just put up, mm -hmm. put it also in the chat is the link to the project page. So do you have any uh, sections left in your doc? Oh, ab absolutely. It's, um, so if people want to go ahead and do it now, they can actually for for sure. And I yeah, I'm we're we're around three fifty. There will be a thousand, um, you know, uh, deeds, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm working on a second property um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this work uh, is going to you know, so this work in various you know you know modes of presentation. It's going to be at least in four shows over the summer um, okay. and, and perhaps others through the fall. So I see this as the, just, this was, you know, the, the, the test. Right. You know, can I make this work legally? You know, what I'm not showing you are the endless conversations I've had with lawyers <laughs> to make this happen, you know, because it seems, you know, they're, you know, a little smart alecky, a little fun, I hope. But it's really serious. It's got some real teeth behind it, um, because I, I know I, I suspect someday I will get a nasty gram from a lawyer representing an oil and gas company, and I am prepared for that. Um, but what I'm doing this is a, a completely legal. This is not. I, this is not a form of civ civil disobedience. I call this uncivil obedience. Uh, because this is what happens to land anyway, just like the, you know, it's, it, you know, because, you know, people have children and then they die and it goes to their children. And you do that a, through a couple of generations. 
And you could have a couple hundred people owning what was once a unified piece of property. So they, this is already a process that I know gets in the way of oil and gas companies. So I'm just pushing it to an extreme limit. And I called the county clerk and I said, you know, I have this property and, you know, I just, there are people I would like to think about in my will. Can I, you know, give it away? And they're like, oh yeah. And I was like, is there a limit? How many people I can give it to? And they're like, no. And I, I said, can I give it away to a million people? And they're like, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you'd pay a lot of filing fees, but yes. So, um, yeah, so there's, I, I would, I invite everybody listening today to, to join me uh, while I am giving away everything. I'm also signing myself up as a participant in the project. So it's not, you know, I, I am going to be along with everybody else. Um, uh, but th this I, I see is a, a much longer term project and in, in just beginning right. for, for, you know, disrupting fracking. Yeah. I love this project. I, I think it's, I think it's brilliant on so many levels. Um, I, I signed up my, my, my wife and my two kids are also owners. <laughs> So we, we did this, I think, when you released it uh, almost a year ago, almost. Yeah, not even. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a brilliant way to, to, to fuse um, artistic practice, uh, community engagement, um, research, uh, un, or uncivil obedience, right? <laughs> um, I love this project. So um, for, for time's sake, because I, I, I could yeah. talk about this project forever. Um, so with the community engagement in your art practice, what are we, what are we planning on doing at Austin P? Okay. So as I hope is clear, I like to experiment with things. Right. So I, I was uh, invited to be part of a, a great residency and I, I, I realize this is, might be a little hard to interpret, but yeah. So interested in climate, is there, you know, you know, uh, we know that certain parts of the area and certainly Tennessee will get wetter and hotter, which means also more humid. I thought, so what will the future feel like? You know, we've seen graphs of where we think temperature will be in the future, but it's a graph. It's hard to, to understand that on any, anything other than an intellectual level. So I bought this cheap greenhouse and I put it, you know, on the lawn of this residency. It wasn't a terribly public area, but it wasn't private either. This was just me and myself and you can barely see me. I'm in, inside there. And I just, I said, I'm going to stay here until the sun passed over the neighboring building and put me in the shade, which was around four or five in the afternoon. So I stayed there for eight hours. And it was a completely miserable experience. Um, I, uh, I did wear a heart rate monitor, you know, just the, what I used to run with and just sitting stock still, I got within three beats of my maximum heart rate. So any, if anybody is an athlete out there, you, you know what that means. So it was really putting a, 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 a stress on my body. And, and so my body in a sense is kind of a stand in for the planet. You know, our bodies are interacting systems as is the planet. And it was just kind of interesting to see, to feel uh, those systems kind of breaking down. And I couldn't stay in there the whole time. If I had stayed in, I, I would have ended up in the hospital for sure. So I just set new rules for myself. When the, the, my heart rate got to a certain point, I would take a break until it had fallen. And then I'd go back in. And what ended up happening completely unprompted was people started looking at me, worrying me. They set up like um, a, a vigil so that someone was always there. And then people brought me fruit and people brought me ice. These, this self-organized system of care, it, it absolutely broke my heart because th that is the technology that we need if to adapt to, the, to whatever the future is going to bring us. You know, it's, yes, it is about, you know, removing carbon or controlling, you know, uh, CO2. It's about a lot of things. But without these 
you know, systems of care, um, you know, our future is going to be pretty bleak. But in that this is a human technology and anybody can develop it and anybody can participate in it. Also, I found very hopeful. And so that was a totally unexpected outcome. And then, um, you know, so this is just people gathering and this was closer towards the end of the day and I, and I was having trouble stringing words together and then the local paper decided to interview me. Um, so, and the next week I took it to the local craft fair and invited people in. And this was, uh, again, you know, just as an experiment to see if how people would react. And it was really interesting. They, uh, you know, you see, you know, a guy there with his two kids. Um, uh, uh, my very first visitor inside the time machine was the CEO of a natural gas company. So we had a, a very short, <laughs> somewhat pointed, but not uncivil conversation. Um, and, and then, but people would also turn the experience to their own. I remember, um, you know, the, yeah, you know, the, people wanting to go back in time. Was, so, okay. So we would just have these roving conversations. So that's, um, that was the experiment of time machine. And then we're going to recreate that on, on yeah. out, outside the art building on mm -hmm. earth day, April 22nd for the whole day. Right. Uh, for you know a number of reasons it's going to be a little different it's going to be a bit more refined uh <laughs> and there in the interactive there'll be two green or two time machines mm -hmm. um and so that others can experience it if they choose i know you know the campus uh is, is not what it usually is but i think we can uh you know entice some people to you know, break up their day and, and come, at least come say hi. If you're on campus, April 22nd, at least come say hi. Right, and right. I'll, I'll try to be uh, somewhat coherent. Yeah, and uh, we'll have, it, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and we'll have, like you said, uh, the two greenhouses set up, um, uh, mostly because of, of COVID issues and social distancing. This was kind of a solution, but we're actually going to hook up microphones and speakers so that if you come, any of you uh, come on campus, you can actually sit in the, the secondary greenhouse and actually have a conversation with yeah. Eliza and also feel the same kind of temperature changes. Another cool thing about this project that I would like to push is that um, we are collaborating with our nursing department. So art and design is collaborating with nursing and we're going to have two nurses on, on um there, not standby, but they're actually there well, working. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think they are. They are standby. They're, yeah. they're standby, but they're also doing active research as far as um, they will be uh, monitoring, uh, recording, and kind of displaying not just the temperature outside, the temperature inside, humidity outside, humidity inside, but also uh, Eliza's uh, vitals, so blood pressure, pulse rate. Um, O2 levels, temperature, um, yeah, temperature. Um, and, you know, my thought is that if we're in April, April is unpredictable. But if any of y'all live in Clarksville today it was 75 and sunny and it was gorgeous, um, which means it'll probably be 110, 120 plus in the greenhouse and putting a human body through that stress was another reason I wanted to get, get nursing involved. <laughs> yeah, but also, and, and these are students from the um, community health class. Mm -hmm. And so these are uh, folks who are learning about systems of care. So it's, right. uh, uh, you know, they're, they have a lot of interest. Think about, you know, the, the lead poisoning of the water in Flint and in other cities in the U.S. This, this you know, are, are central issues in that class. So nice. while... Yes, they are going to keep an eye on me and perhaps <laughs> and, and in um, and in speaking with the nursing faculty, I, I thought I was doing a pretty good job of uh, monitoring myself in my first experiment and, and they, they disagreed. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we're, we're going to have a, a much more robust oversight, uh, which I guess is a good thing. I need to keep all the brain cells I have. 
<laughs> right. And if we have any um, art and design students uh, here listening and want to like kind of help out, get involved, um, we'll have a big kind of whiteboard that's actually going to uh, keep track of all the, uh, the data. And if anyone's interested in putting together any data visualization or kind of making um, uh, stuff like that, you know, as far as we can taking that data and making something out of it you're more than welcome to yeah. and or then if you, or if you just want to bring me fruit and ice and, and <laughs> ice chips and <laughs> yeah that that would be more than welcome right right and 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 hang out with us on earth day um uh a great question in the chat that just popped up so will you physically prep for this in any sort of way I have thought about that. Um, I'm reading up on it and I think I will. Uh, it's just my, my mother is not really happy that I've commandeered her greenhouse. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I have a couple protocols for doing that. And because I, I think I, I'm, I'm seeing it as a challenge how to stay in the greenhouse as long as possible without putting myself in danger. And that right. there is a way. And we know, look, we know people can labor in extraordinary circumstances. So this is, um, you know, this, this is a feat for me and probably would not be for, you know, people in other, you know, outside occupations. Um, but again, just, you know, it's adapt, you know, it's about adaptation. It's, you know, there's the human technology, you know, the systems of care, but also just, can we adapt? We know we can adapt and certain people can adapt and others can't like, um, uh, when, when this was interactive, there were some quite, you know, some elderly folks with some heart issues who wanted to check it out. And I thought, well, why don't we have a chat outside? Um, yeah, and because I, I think while the danger may be minimal, it's not zero. Right. Well, that was my, my, my kind of question, too. I mean, as an artist and being smart about it, right, you want to train so it doesn't hurt you to actually make this point. Um, but that's but it's not, than that. But it's also, you know, just getting it kind of embracing the exercise more fully. It's This right. is more about than just physical conditioning right but a lot of us yeah. especially in our culture are not really prone to physical conditioning and so where is that also another layer of this project like as it goes as we get hotter and outdoor activities like decrease because we're not adapting fast enough to be outdoors that's a whole nother socioeconomic kind of uh obesity health issues right with obesity and heart rate and heart disease that well it's not like that but you know they're like the, the very old and the very young are really going to struggle with some of these yeah. um, conditions, you know, and anyone whose health is compromised. And then uh, urban areas because of the heat island effect and, you know, who lives in urban areas and is, are the adaptive practices uh, like cooling rooms or uh, subsidized, you know, uh, ener ener you know, energy bills so that people can run their air, air conditioning. You know, I lived in Austin and they did have programs so that people could run their air conditioning. And, it, and there, so those programs are going to have to be much more, much better funded and much more robust or, or, you know, we know what's going to happen. You know, those people with the fewest resources are really uh, going to have big problems. Um, and we already know that, um, you know, we're used to seeing, you know, the devastation of weather events and the loss of life, but the number one loss of life due to weather across the globe is heat stroke and it's getting worse. You know, this, this project isn't about heat stroke necessarily, but it is, um, you know, that, that is a symptom that our body exhibits in what, what we expect will be our new um, circumstances. Could you talk about your data collection at the start of a project and what that process or activities go into the pre-project? Um, well, I, I think the process is, part of my creative process, no matter what, is I go and read widely i go talk to people um one of the projects i did not show you was from very very early in santa fe i 
did a series of portraits based on people, incarcerated people with my exact birth date. And I obsessed over this. And it, I went down the rabbit hole into criminal justice. And I, you know, I attended conferences and protests. And I talked to people working uh, with women who are inc incarcerated because uh, they defended themselves against their domestic abusers. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, an, a question, so there's the material work and then there's the, those driving questions. So there's, there's always a lot more. Hey, Leslie, um, T Terry Fox, there's a reason. We're, okay, this reminds me of Canadian athlete Terry Fox who ran across Canada to raise awareness and money for cancer research. Oh, cool. I'm glad that came to mind. Um, okay. so, so what do you think, um, what is your expectations of with having the time machine here at Austin P? Um, um, to pull it, to, just to pull it off or uh, are you looking to collect more data? Like what? No, what no, the goal, no, the data is interesting, but that's not the goal. Um, right. The goal, uh, well, because these are times of COVID, both the, in, you know, whatever interpersonal, you know, whatever interaction I can have, mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of ways to have that. Of course, it can be, you know, on site, on campus. Uh, I think we're going to video stream this. Um, uh, even in, in the earlier experiment, there was actually some social media activity. I, I would hardly call it viral, but you know, friends of friends who posted about it were checking in on me at the end of the day. And so I think there, there are a number of ways to experience this, to, to communicate with me and each other and let it unfold. And I have no, I have no agenda because each, this may be a recreation and a refinement of an earlier experiment, but this is going to be new and different because the circumstances are different. And, and we've also, you know, it was, it's been two years since that, that first experiment and, and the world is a different place and the way we interact with each other. So I'm, you know, I'm, I, so again, you know, I don't have, I have questions. I don't have statements. Yeah. Right. Just, just let it, let it unfold. Um, and the, you know, the weather has a lot to do with that. And then, you know, um, if there are fewer people on campus or more people on campus, uh, and, and who's willing to have at least some sort of communication or conversation remotely via, via right. social media. Right. Yeah. So we are going to do our best to live stream some of this on our, on the art and design, uh, Instagram which might tie into our Facebook. Um, um, I'll put those um, handles up again in the chat in just a second. Um, so going back to your um, all the way to hell project. Mm -hmm. um, I know you said around 350. Is that where you're at now? Um, yeah. If you do reach the thousand, would you increase it or keep it at a thousand? Well, uh, no, if I got more, uh, I would definitely include people. I mean, and there's a way, and there are ways to do that. Um, right. So you're not setting a limit at a thousand. That was just a good starting that, number? That was just, you know, it, it seemed like a reach goal. <laughs> you know, I, I, fi I figured it would take, you know, maybe two years, you know, or, uh, yeah, it, I mean, if it, there was no, planning for or expectation this this would be any viral thing and i i like the i i hope to have some sort of relationship with the people who are participating it, it might be fairly cursory but but yeah i just thought a, th a thousand just seemed like a pretty decent number um right. you know less than a million more than everybody i know <laughs> so right um, in, a, in a way to distribute it widely because they're, you know, I, they're, I've had people say, Hey, this is the first piece of property I've ever owned. And it might be the only piece of property I've ever owned. Wow. So people are, have their, 
have their own motivations for doing it. You know, some of them do have an activist orientation. They are perfectly happy to be in the way of oil companies, but others have other reasons. And that is perfectly acceptable, welcome, and legitimate. Right. Um, so uh, we have a student that has kids um, at Austin P. So they want to know how they can get involved. So I'm assuming like with All the Way to Hell Project, they can actually, if as long as their kids are U.S. citizens, they can sign them up for the mental rights, right? Yeah, they, they can just, right now, they can just go to the website and f fill it out. It's just, a, I do need a, a, a legit uh, mailing address. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some people hesitate to give that. Uh, I will not be displaying it. Uh, it will be, you know, filed away in the county clerk's office. Um, but, I, and I will be sending a certificate memorializing the ownership right um you know so and, that this is a real thing um, right and if they involve their kids on earth day they can actually you can just bring them to campus oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah like sure, i said sure. we'll have the second the second greenhouse so they can actually yeah. sit in the greenhouse yeah. um and and the nursing is actually going to be set up a booth that's actually going to talk about uh, other ecological and health issues such as water contamination they have some information out there from the nursing program. Um, so this is another question that came in. And it's, and it's an interesting, a great question for, uh, for anyone, especially students. Um, so how do, you, um, how do you find funding or how do you fund the projects? Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, well, the, funny story. Uh, I was initially going to sell these for some like nominal amount of money because it mm -hmm. does cut... Uh, it does cost, you know, there are legal fees, you know, I thought each deed had to be filed individually. And so this was going to be really expensive. And after many, many conversations with lawyers, uh, I found out that would, that would have been a felony um, for me to have sold the mineral oh, wow. rights. And so I'm like, okay, what can I do? Can I give them away? So I have a 10 space, uh, 10 page single spaced opinion from a lawyer saying you can give away your legal, I mean, you can give away your mineral rights. And I absolutely love that that happened, you mm -hmm. know, it, uh, because it made it much more accessible. It just took money out of the relationship entirely, which is really liberating. And at the same time, I found out I could put everybody on one deed and everybody is their own individual owner. You know, they, as I said before, they can sell it or give it away or ignore it. Uh, but everybody can go in one deed, which just collapsed the, over, the overhead of this project enormously. So uh, how I have spent my winter <laughs> is applying for money. Um, and, you know, I just paid for the lawyer uh I, I many of the lawyers gave me their time so was, i've been really lucky but the that one 10 page opinion i paid for that because it's everything hangs on that right. that opinion is what makes this project le legitimate it's not a gesture this is a real thing gotcha gotcha so we have um time for maybe one or two more questions i have one in here uh in the chat or in the q a that how will we be able to communicate you with you on Earth Day? And that is a great question that I think we can both figure out a way. I can, we can do a live thing and I can ask the questions directly or they can maybe chime in. That's a logistical question for me, I guess. And we'll set no, that I, up. Well, yeah, this is, this is our next conversation. But I think <laughs> right. you can always, you can all, always find me at, um, I'm going to put my Instagram which is, there's that. Um, right. I'll use that. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I realize most of the people here don't use that, but that's still a useful means of communicating with me. Um, and then the stream. And so we'll, we'll, we'll all, and we'll, we'll publish, publish that. That's a month away. And uh, right. thanks for, thanks for asking the question. Right. And I, and I also put, um, our Facebook and Instagram there. So we'll kind of maybe work together and, and sure. it, it, it probably Absolutely. won't be streaming all day. Cause we're like talking like an eight hour, like nine to four ish. Um, so it probably won't be streaming all day, but maybe a, a couple hours there. 
Yeah, no, eight eight hours of watching someone avoid heat stroke is <laughs> really great TV. <laughs> <laughs> We call it, yeah, we'll set up a hey, we'll set up a surveillance camera so people can just chime in or just watch it like an Earth Cam, Eliza yeah, Earth I Cam, would, like or you know instead of little you know eagle chicks, it can be Liza <laughs> the Panda Cam. That's right. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, all right. So, if uh, there's no more questions, so thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Eliza. Um, it's been a pleasure, kind of working through this project for the past year and a half almost two years and now we're here and um and i love learning about your other work and um yeah you're you're doing some really great stuff really important stuff and it's it's a pleasure to have you here well the, i i couldn't be more delighted well first to know you michael and the support uh from austin p has been phenomenal so i'm in in the art department for sure in nursing I, i've just you guys are so open and collaborative and that's a that's as a, a an artist who generally spends time in the studio that's, that's a real delight thank you all right. all right well thank you everyone um um just to uh kind of keep you up a little plugs next week we have another talk our second um tennessee artist fellow sika tennessee artist fellow we're beginning to talk about their work benji russell is next week. Um, and then the following week, we will be talking with Stephanie Sajuko. So um, to kind of finish out our uh, speaker series. So thank you for everyone that has been tuning in this semester. It's been a, a, a lot of artist talks and hopefully next semester we can uh, do, <laughs> do this in person. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you, Eliza. I appreciate that. Thanks to the Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts for making all this happen, too. So good night, everyone. <laughs>